There's still plenty of time to get to free agency, but let's reset the conversation and talk team needs and how the Bengals will likely attack this year's free agency. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Lockdown Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. Today, we dive into a bit of a free agency primer, a little bit of a conversation reset as franchise tag news might be coming down by the time you listen to this episode. We'll cover that tomorrow if anything has occurred as a franchise tag deadline has opened. You can find the show on YouTube, anywhere you get your podcasts. If you're new to the show, if you want to become an everydayer, just hit that subscribe button and make sure you don't miss a day of off-season content as things are really ramping up here, James. we got the combine right around the corner and free agency to dive into. Shortly after that, we're going to get into those topics today. Well, not the combine, but free agency. Yeah, including my hate. My hate, 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 hate for Noah Fant that yeah. really isn't hate, but we will get to Noah Fant coming up. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. We'll make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 150 bucks. If your bet wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And Jake, the Bengals have a lot of needs. That's why I'm not totally on the pay a tight end, or at least top of the market tight end. Uh, in, in by the way, this market, not necessarily the Travis Kelsey market or overall tight end position to be clear, but I look at right tackle. I look at defensive tackle and I want the Bengals to prioritize those two spots over tight end. And that's where, uh, I think we can start th this free agency conversation because the Bengals have had big needs coming off that Super Bowl year where they win the AFC championship. I think we all realized offensive line is what they needed to prioritize. They did that. Last year, I think running back and tight end were two spots that we looked at. Obviously, safety was a spot they, that we looked at. And they weren't able to find the right fits to where those spots are still being discussed now. And there are multiple others, including, like I said, right tackle and uh, defensive tackle that are probably at the top of the list need-wise. Yeah, we talked a lot about tight end. Obviously, in episodes this week, we've talked about Brock Bowers for two straight episodes. We talked about tight end last week. We talked about it last year. We talked about it in DMs today before we started recording, James. And you slid into my DMs. Was it me or was it you? I don't know. <laughs> the, tight, the tight end thirst in Cincinnati is real, though. That yeah. I think we can all say and feel, which and, I get it. I do. And it's been a topic along with the offensive line for – a couple of years. And I bet you if you put Duke Tobin's feet to the fire or gave him truth serum, whichever one of those is less harmful, and you asked him, why didn't you guys make a bigger run at free agents last year at the tight end position? They, they kind of went with what they had. They, they went and got Tanner Hudson. They tried to get in on some budget tight ends and they eventually landed on a budget tight end because it had worked for them in the past partially. But also I think they thought they could get a tight end in the draft. And then they did and then they were going with the guys they had. They never established a chemistry between Irv Smith Jr. and Joe Burrow last year with Burrow missing camp. And that never really picked up over the course of the year. Smith's snap count, in fact, dropping over the course of the year. So I really do think that part of that was because they thought they could get a tight end in the draft. And while we spent two episodes this week talking about Brock Bowers, when you look at this year's approach to the draft, and what we've been talking about in terms of approach to the draft and those needs you listed, there's a lot of different things they need to accomplish in free agency, including some of their own guys, both high and mid and low level free agents that they have to make decisions on that needs to happen before they get to the draft to stay open, right? We've talked about that all week. And that's why we're starting with these needs because it really portrays this spread that the Bengals have to address. And if you have to address a big spread, that might prohibit them a little bit from playing in the top end of any of these positions. Not that you would expect them to anyway. Last year's uh, Orlando Brown signing kind of being a, an exception to how we expect the Bengals to behave in free agency. You would expect instead more of what we've seen them do 
the previous few years where they're kind of in the middle of these markets and maybe making multiple swings, especially like you said, a defensive tackle where there is a need for multiple players. Yeah. And, and that's where, that's where it comes from because something's going to suffer. You know, maybe they go budget friendly at right tackle and, and they splurge at tight end because of how deep this tackle class is. And they think they're going to get a, a starting caliber right tackle, at least long-term at 18, maybe not plug and play day one. I think that's still really hard, by the way, whoever they draft at 18, I think it's hard outside of a few, including Brock Bowers. It's hard for me to say, all right, they're plug and play and, and they're going to have an instant impact. Right tackle, it's it's a hard spot to walk in and be great at right away. And so we'll see when it comes to these offensive linemen. But something is going to take a backseat. And in recent years, it has been tight end. And I, I think if I had to predict, it might go that way again. I'm not against signing a super athletic former first round pick, right? I love the Hayden Hurst signing. And I think Noah Fant is a better player than Hayden Hurst. But I, I don't want the Bengals to overextend at tight end when I think they're they could get more. I don't even want to say more bang for their buck, but they could add better players at key spots. For example, I want them, and I think you do too. Michael and Wenu, throw yourself, throw your hat into that ring. If you're going to go after the probably the second best free agent tight end, how about you just go for the first or second best right tackle and a guy who has position flex and someone who to me w would be an upgrade uh, from Jonah Williams, but some may say otherwise outside of Cincinnati and say Jonah's the top tackle. Who cares? Whatever. But go after Michael and Wenu. And I, I don't think they will. I think their big, big spend will be that franchise tag on T Higgins. And then they'll go after the mid tier level. And maybe Noah Fant is in that mix, which is fine, but I, I don't want that to impact their their overall plan at right tackle or defensive tackle. If you can do all of them, do all of them. I would love it. I also think that history tells us, uh, a Jamar Chase looming extension tells us that they won't be able to do all of them or they won't view it that way and, and they'll be conservative in certain areas. And so I would prioritize right tackle and defensive tackle over tight end. That's all I, I was saying with the Fant stuff last, what was it, last week this time? Yeah, it was last week. Uh, not against Noah Fant. I do not have an, an I hate Noah Fant jersey in my closet right here, even though that would be kind of funny, I guess. But no, I do not have that. I think he could be really good with Joe Burrow, but I don't know it, and I wouldn't prioritize tight end over one of the tackle spots. That's all. I think what we need to then discuss is what they will actually do, how much they will actually spend, and how Noah Fant fits or doesn't fit. If we're going to center the, the conversation around Noah Fant, which we certainly can, I, I don't know that we necessarily should, but that is a piece that obviously we've been talking about uh, on, on those Twitter streets before we recorded uh, on Tuesday. But you, you think about their approach typically, they're probably not in the Justin Matta BK sweepstakes if he's not franchise tag. They're probably not in the Christian Wilkins sweepstakes if he's not franchise tag. Like you said, they're probably not in a Michael and Wenner. Is that right? No, nah, debatable. Probably not. But that's certainly not something that their philosophy has typically been. Has it changed? Maybe. Maybe one of these guys comes to them the way Orlando Brown came to them and saw a really good fit, an opportunity to get the kind of role they were after where Orlando Brown's ability to play left tackle in Cincinnati, I'm sure was a factor for him mm -hmm. given his motivations. Right. And, and he knows that Joe Burrow can go win just like we've seen tweets from Jermaine Illuminor talking about Joe Burrow's ability, not saying Jermaine Illuminor is necessarily the best target at right tackle, but we've seen players talk about that. And you could see that happen again, potentially with the top of market guy, but I don't think that that's their most likely path. We could also see them make a change and start front loading Ooh. deals more with cash, more Ooh. toward the Orlando Brown structure to lower that first year cap hit a little bit more and go more towards 65% of the APY being the year one cap hit instead of closer to 70%, 75% for some of their other free agents. That allows them to do more this year and push cap hits out into the future with the expanding cap, which, by the way, is now being discussed at 250 instead of 242 for year 2024. So we'll continue to talk about what the Bengals could do and how this could all come together with those things in mind coming up next.
Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. From quick bets to same game parlays, exclusive props, and so much more. The NBA season resumes on Thursday. And whether it's LeBron, Steph, maybe you think the Joker and the Denver Nuggets, Nikola Jokic, they're going to get it figured out and go back to back. Well, FanDuel is your spot for all things NBA, NFL draft, NFL futures. So go there now. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. James, let's talk expectation setting. Let's get into that. I think they're going to do a lot. A lot. I think they're going to be busy. I think we're going to be busy. And they need to be busy because there's just so many things they need to address. And and, and we haven't discussed this a lot recently, except for maybe with Jermaine Illuminar. But it's it's true. And you kind of hinted at it a few minutes ago. But they're a destination. If I'm a free agent defensive tackle, I want to go play in Cincinnati alongside Trey Hendrickson and and with a team that has Joe Burrow at quarterback and a veteran like Mike Hilton and, and who knows, maybe alongside DJ Reader and all that, you want to play in Cincinnati. Of course, the money has to be right, but I, I do think that they're a destination. So it's not just on offense where if I'm a running back or I'm a tight end, of course you want to play with Joe Burrow, but but certainly on defense as well. And I think that will be their priority is getting, adding a little sand in their pockets, so to speak, getting a little heavier in the, the, the defensive tackle room. I think that's where they'll start because I, I look at this draft and it is, and I know the offensive tackles are going to go early. You know, you don't know who's going to be there at 18, but the defensive tackle draft, at least at the top, there's a few guys and then it drops. And then who knows how many of those guys will you bank on in the mid rounds, you know, let's say rounds two through four to be instant impact contributors. Tavondre Sweat is more likely to go in round one, by the way, than round three for all those mock drafters out there. And so that's something they have to weigh. And that's why I think they'll attack it, given we've talked about this, given the veterans that could be out there could change with the franchise tag. But you go after some of these mid-level guys, the Sheldon Rankins level guys, you keep B.J. Hill, right? And you add guys of that talent level. And then who knows, maybe you do bring D.J. Reader back at the right money as he continues to progress. He posted a story on Tuesday on Instagram of him working out at the Bengals facilities. He won't be able to do that when the new league year starts because he'll be a free agent. So we'll uh, we'll see how quickly uh, he signs elsewhere or, or is, is able to sign with the Bengals. But I think defensive tackle will be priority one, and it would not shock me on day one of the legal tampering period if the Bengals were able to get something done with at least one veteran. Yeah, and nose tackle specifically among the defensive tackle positions is something that they need to add because you talk about the draft. Tavondre Sweat is like the only top-end nose tackle in this class. A lot of the other guys that are discussed as potential day two picks are not really the nose tackle type. I know Byron Murphy played a lot of nose tackle at Texas for a day one pick example, but he's not a nose tackle in the NFL. I, I don't think anyway, like he might be able to align there a few times, but that's more three of tech. your three tech. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So regardless of what their plans are in the draft, I think nose tackle is a position they a hundred percent will address in, in the free agency period. If we're talking about things that we think we're, we're power ranking things that we expect them to do. Nose tackle is at the very top of that list for me, James, maybe followed by right tackle maybe followed then by defensive tackle depth. And and those are the the ones at the very top of the list for me. I guess not including their own guys, because including their own guys, they're going to sign a tight end. They have zero Mm -hmm. on the roster. You can guarantee they're going to sign a tight end. But for for external guys, that's where I'm thinking the shopping kind of needs to start if if they can only do one thing, which isn't how it works. They can do multiple things at once, right? But nose tackle. Is, is one that is highlighted, bolded, underlined, italicized, whatever you want to call it, something that they have to address in this offseason. Yep, they do. And, and I, I think it is risky to say, all right, we addressed it with DJ Reader. I love DJ. He's coming off of a really serious injury. And 
I think they'll view it that way. And so who do they go after? It's it, it's something that I, I, I agree with you. I think they will prioritize. And they know there aren't many nose tackles that that they can just get and plug in. And, uh, you know, maybe there's someone they like and they can develop. And by the way, I thought last year in the draft that they may go that route late and, and draft someone to kind of develop behind DJ just in case. And we discussed that and it didn't happen. And so now I think they'll have to spend. But that doesn't mean that they'll go against the other positions. I just, I think from, from a tight end perspective, you agree they'll have right tackle ahead of tight end, they'll have defensive tackle ahead of tight end at minimum. I think those two are ahead of it. Probably. What they do with what they do with Joe Mixon looms pretty large, I, I think, if, if, as far as prioritizing that. But I do think that there's enough backs out there, depending on what they're looking for, that that doesn't have to be a, a legal tampering day type thing. It might be after free agency officially starts. Yeah, for, for running back, yeah, I could see that. I think they'll probably be exploring tight end in that pre-free agency window. I would assume, at least with the own hope. guys, if not external guys. Yeah. Um, on the topic of BJ Hill, really quick before I forget, you mentioned uh, the decision around Joe Mixon. Jeremy Fowler did mention BJ Hill as a potential cap cut candidate for the Cincinnati Bengals going into the last year of his deal. They would save seven and a half million dollars against a two mil- two and a half million dollar cap hit. So, seven and a half million dollars of cap space is a fair amount of money. The reason it would surprise me especially if they did this early, like in the next couple of weeks, is that they just don't have anybody else there. I could see it if it's they've signed a couple of guys and then they make the decision. But I think they'd like BJ Hill. I think. I'm pretty yeah. sure they're they're happy with the way he played. And it's not like he's making huge money. I would be pretty surprised to see that cap cut coming. But if you could get better and, and that move would help them get better somehow from that, that money that, that they would then be able to put toward another player. I guess we shouldn't be shocked, um, but I kind of see it somewhat similarly, not not exactly the same because he's a captain and he's been in Cincinnati for his entire career to Sam Hubbard, where they could save a bunch of cap space there as well with a restructure or or a release, but I just don't see it happening. That's something that we talked about earlier in the offseason and, and we've since kind of dismissed as a possibility. Yeah, I think with Hill, final year of his deal, over three million in dead cap, and what do you have there? There's nothing. You you literally you literally start from square one. If if you were to move on from, I I don't really see many scenarios where it gets them better. Yeah, and and I, I think the way they could look at it with how they structure whoever they target in free agency at defensive tackle is all right. We have B.J. Hill coming off the books in a year, mm-hmm. and and so as much as they're spending in that defensive line room, and they are with. Trey Hendrickson, obviously Sam Hubbard, like you mentioned, I, I think they'll keep BJ. And to me, that makes sense. Could it happen? Anything can happen. I, I would be pretty surprised. I actually think of the two, I, I think a, rest- a restructure, a reworking of Sam Hubbard's deal would be more likely than just cutting BJ Hill. And I don't think either are likely. But yeah. if I just had to, to rank them, I, 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 I would go that route because I, I just think BJ is valuable and you're saving 7 million. Are you, are you finding the next, even BJ Hill? Can you replace him for 7 million? Realistically, I, I, you can, but it's really, really hard to do. And we've talked about it. They have a bunch of different challenges in different other, you know, other different holes on this roster that they need to address, including one at that spot that BJ plays got to build around him, not just let him go. Yeah. And he would be creating a need if they were to move on there. You would now need a three tech who can play in multiple packages and a nose tackle where at least now you can say, all right, I've got a guy that I can start beside whatever nose tackle we acquired this year. Maybe beyond that, they feel like they just need to get better depth. And so maybe then their thought process is let's get a nose tackle and we'll play in the mid to low end of the market for guys that are going to be better than what we had last year behind that. Because the idea that they're going to go spend significantly more on the defensive line than they have been for the past few seasons when Joe Burrow was on his rookie deal and T Higgins and, and, and Jamar Chase were on their rookie deals. That's hard to think about too. So maybe they need another starter there, but behind that, behind that starter, I wouldn't expect them to be spending more money at defensive line in 2024 than they did this year necessarily. But let's talk more about tight ends 
and talk more about how Noah Fant may or may not fit as well to finish up the show here coming up next. All right, Jake, let's talk about Noah Fant some more because I, I do think he fits, by the way. Let's just start there. Football-wise, I think he fits. Age-wise, athleticism-wise, I love all of it from, from that perspective, and I get why people are so high on him. As long as you could sign him without disrupting whatever their plan is elsewhere, that's fine. I just don't want Noah Fant to keep them from going after Unwedded or going after Wilkins, or going after Matabike, or or whatever big idea that they could possibly have. Because to me, let's drop down a few tiers at tight end and make it work. Drop down a few tiers at running back, if needed, from the targets, right? I wouldn't spend money at running big r- money at running back either. Like if Saquon becomes a free agent, I'd rather prioritize Michael and Wenu than Saquon Barkley. That might be a take for some people. Other people might get it, and, and which is maybe surprising for me because I'm the skill player guy, but I want to address those those spots in the draft as well. And if you're spending huge resources at them, then, then you're kind of pigeon, pigeonholing yourself into what, Jermaine Illuminar? I'm fine with him, but I wouldn't want to just do that. So I, I think Fant would fit, though, and, and I think he would be the best tight end they've had in a while, but I, I don't want to flirt with that $10 million per year mark because I I think that that would be like you you could look up and that could be their second biggest addition and really first biggest because they're going to count the T Higgins tag. Like Mm -hmm. that, that would not shock me by the way, if at that $10 million mark, if he got to that, that that was their biggest free agency addition from a money average annual value standpoint. And it depends a little bit on what positions they go after. Some positions get paid more than others. A lot of positions get paid more than tight end. You, sure. you start, you sign a cornerback that you're expecting to play at the level you would expect George Fant or Noah Fant to play at for you. Sorry, two Fants, different position. Or, or you you pay a tackle money that you're expecting to get that kind of level, tight end one, uh, starting right tackle, the, the kind of p- production you're expecting to get from Noah Fant. You're paying a lot more money than the nine or eight. It's actually down to eight. By the way, we, when we were talking about this last week, Brad Spielberger's projection for Noah Fant was $9 million per year. That's down to $8 million per year since then. So a little adjustment there from Brad, there which we is go. interesting. And, and nope. Drop it a little lower, Brad. Get me at 7.5 and let's ride. But, but here's uh, just some stats that I mentioned to you earlier, James, on the Noah Fant topic in particular. And, and why you could see it fit is, one, because you talk about those big targets, the, the big fish that the Bengals could go after in free agency – I don't think either of us think that that's terribly likely, even if we think they should be going after one of those guys, perhaps one of those defensive tackles or or Michael and Lenu. That's not really their MO. Their MO is typically to play in a lower bucket and try to find value. And and we've talked about that with guys like Trey Hendrickson and DJ Reader. Some of their bigger expenditures are still not top of market guys. They're still in kind of the second to third tier of money at those positions. And, and DJ Reader is certainly higher for, for nose tackles at the time, but since then, those markets have continued to increase. So if they continue to kind of follow that pattern and kind of be mid to high level for some guys, mid-level for some guys, that's where you can see an $8 million contract for a tight end be something they want to do. But that would also be a change to their philosophy where they have not valued tight end very highly for really the entire Joe Burrow, Zach Taylor tenure in Cincinnati where they're not spending a lot of money at the position, but the stats I wanted to get to were comparing Hunter Henry to, to Noah Fant just from a, the deal that, that Henry got versus what's expected for Fant before Henry got his free agency deal. He missed a year with injury, but even accounting for that, he averaged 580 yards and just over five touchdowns per year. And then he got a deal for 12 and a half million per year from the Patriots uh, for at the time, 6.8% of the salary cap was at $12.5 million. Noah Fant averaged just a little bit fewer yards in his career to date, 561 versus 580. A lot fewer touchdowns, and this is certainly a big differentiator between the two of them because he had zero last year for Seattle. That brings his average down to 2.8 touchdowns per year versus five over five for, for Hunter Henry. But that $8 million, $9 million, 
that's in the low 3% of the cap projection for 2024. It might be at about 3%, 3.2% for 2024's projected cap. So when you think about it from that perspective, $8 million for Fant compared to what Hunter Henry ended up getting, which is probably an overpay by the Patriots at the time, and Fant having a higher athletic ceiling and a higher draft pedigree to go with him, doesn't actually sound too crazy to me when I put it in that context. Sure. The Hunter deal, the Henry deal sucked too. I, and I said that. Your, no, I know, but I'm just saying like that's comparing a bad deal to now in a vacuum Fant for 8 million or 9 million. That's not a, well, but people wanted to pay, people wanted to pay CJ Uzama that here. Yeah, but, but not, Kevin. but not even in a vacuum, like thinking about what we expect them to do right? What we've been talking about for this entire episode, how much money we expect them and think they will actually give out to, to these other positions and the kind of contracts we expect them to be doing, right? Would you rather spend $16 million at on, on two defensive tackles or $10 million and $4 million at defensive tackle? I would rather spend the $4 million at at tight end, right? And, and that's, that's why I mentioned Hunter Henry. It, it isn't because I think Henry's a better player necessarily. It's because I think he's going to go for less and he's, he's older and that's kind of where they're at. Like now, if it doesn't impact them at all, if they identify these, these defensive tackles that they're signing anyway, and, and they can still make Fant work. Great. I love it. And I, I think that I, I could not only get on board, but I think it could work in this Bengals offense, but I just don't, we know how they are. And so that's, they probably have like three, seven to $10 million slots that they're, they're open to. And, and to me, that's probably right. That, that To me, I would prioritize right tackle and two defensive tackle spots. And it might not even be three, just to be, be clear. That might be wishful thinking on my end. So it's, it's tough. Now, if they're still willing to do that and go after Fant, sign me up. If the tight end market dries up, like it did last off season when Dalton Schultz is just sitting there and you, they could have stolen him, man. Yeah, of course. But I, and I, I by the way, I, I don't think either of us expect Schultz to be around long. And I think he'll be the top tight end in free agency, but y- you get the point there. But yeah, I, like that, that's why I mean in a vacuum, but with the Bengals, the reason they haven't prioritized tight end is because I, they've, They've prioritized all these other positions. And I don't think they would be wrong to do that in free agency here, given where their holes are and how important those holes are to fill. I would be surprised to see them spend on two different free agent defensive tackles, like starter level money. I think I'd be surprised. You talk about doing right tackle, two defensive tackles that that are, you know, eight, nine million dollars a piece. I think I'd be surprised. Just to see. I think that's what they should do. I think that's what they should do, though. Right, but but if we're talking about what we expect them to do, I would say like one starting defensive lineman, one depth defensive lineman, a starting right tackle. They need to get a starting tight end, and it would be out of character for them to to sign Fant based on what they have done. But if there is this push toward two tight end stuff that we saw late in the year that we're seeing around the NFL and the Bengals are on board for that idea, then that would signal a philosophical change, especially with Tyler Boyd departing most likely as a free agent, right? You could see... That, again, as an opportunity we talked about for them to transform their identity on offense. And that's what Noah Fant would signal. It wouldn't be signaling a change, but it, it would be interesting. I think, so with that said, you expect, if they re-sign DJ Reader, you expect that to be their big addition to the defensive front. He's not signing yeah. for $5 million. No, I, I think that they would maybe go for a depth piece alongside that, but I don't think they're paying somebody else $10 million a year, $8 million a year. I think that would surprise me a little bit. Reader in a $5 million depth piece. And I'm all due respect to Reader. That is not enough. I would be really upset, not upset, but bothered by them. I mean, did they, did they watch? <laughs> they need to get, uh, they, they need to add uh, multiple guys. And even if they took, let's just say Johnny Newton's there at 18 and everyone loves him and they took him at 18. That's fine. You can find a role for him right away and he can make an impact if he's ready to go, even with two additions. With, with B.J. Hill in the last year of his deal, like we mentioned. So you might be right. I am I, I think it's a, a multi-body, like capable, more than capable, not like flyer guys, like guys that can actually 
you could pencil in as like, okay, September 13th or whatever their first game is. These guys can go out there alongside BJ Hill and, and be a problem for opposing offenses. I think I would just be surprised from a positional spending perspective. They would be spending so much money on the defensive line. They would be spending more on the defensive line in that scenario than they have been for the previous years. And that's, like I said, when Burrow, Chase, and Higgins were all on rookie deals, and that would no longer be the case. And so you're spending more on defensive line, more at wide receiver, more at quarterback, more on defensive line as well, most likely. You're, you're then spending a whole lot less at some other positions to make that work. And and there are not a lot at tight end, not there. a lot at corner, not a lot at right. safety. But there are some positions where they have rookie deals, but you know, we've also talked about them going and getting a veteran corner for depth, not a, not a high money one. We talked about them getting a veteran safety again, not a high dollar player, but there are these other spots where we're talking about them also signing guys there. And so from a positional spending, positional allocation perspective, it's going to change this year with T. Higgins and, and Joe Burrow's money potentially hitting and Jamar Chase potentially getting an extension, but they, they do have to spread it around as well. And that's, so that's the, we've come full circle. Do they prioritize tight end no, with all typically. these needs or do they prioritize the, the trenches? Cause we haven't even gotten into right tackle and what that, you know, like specific guys. So mm -hmm. it's, that's the dilemma, and and that's one that I think they'll have resolved certainly before free agency hits. And part of that's the the combine next week, and uh, part of it's tagging T, which we certainly expect to happen at some point. Yeah, plenty to to keep an eye on at the combine as people are talking. Uh, it's a great time for the rumor mill in the NFL, the, the NFL combine and. Indianapolis, a fantastic time to learn information about what teams are planning to do in the offseason, what's expected for various free agents. So that'll be a whole lot of fun next week. And we'll have more time to talk about the, some potential Bengals offseason plans, James, and some potential approaches they could take with various position allocations. As we've been discussing here today, we'll have time to dive into that further between now and the start of free agency. Until then, that's going to do it for this episode of the Lockdown Bengals podcast. Thanks for listening. Hooday, and have a good one.